Uh, also tonight, President Biden's high-stakes interview. We just got our first clip from uh, Biden's highly anticipated interview with NBC News, and in it, President Biden talks about Trump's assassination attempt, his phone call with the former president, and more. Listen to this. Mr. President, thank you for sitting down with us. There's a lot to talk about. I'd like to start with the horrible events of last weekend. It has shocked a lot of Americans. A political rally, your opponent, Donald Trump, uh, shot uh, in the middle of greeting his, his supporters. Um, you spoke to Mr. Trump afterward. Can you give me a, a sense of that conversation? Very cordial. I told him how concerned I was and wanted to make sure I knew how he was actually doing. <clears throat> he sounded good. He said he was fine. And he thanked me for calling him. I told him he was literally in the prayers of Jill and me. And I hope his whole family was weathering this. Well, let's talk about the conversation this has started. And it's really about language, what we say out loud and the consequences of those. You called your opponent an existential threat uh, on a call a week ago. You said it's time to put Trump in the bullseye. There's some dispute about the, the context, but I think you appreciate the I didn't say crosshairs. I was talking about focus on it. Look, the truth of the matter was, what I guess I was talking about at the time was, there was very little focus on Trump's uh, agenda. Yeah, the term was bullseye. It was, a, it was a mistake to use the word. I didn't, I didn't say crosshairs. I meant bullseye. I meant focus on him. Focus on what he's doing. Focus on, on, his, on his policies. Focus on the number of lies he told in the debate. Focus on, I mean, there's, there's a whole range of things that, look, I'm not the guy that said, I want to be a dictator on day one. I'm not the guy that refused to accept the outcome of the election. I'm not the guy who said that one accept the outcome of this election automatically. You can't only love your country when you win. Mr. President, you've been in politics a very long time, so let, let's speak frankly. We're all adults here. Has this shooting changed the trajectory of this race? I don't know, and you don't know either. I don't know, but, no, but no, have you been something I, you've given I, thought to? No, I... I've thought less about the trajectory of the case than two things. One, what his health is, that that was secure, number one. And number two, what happens from here on in terms of the kind of coverage that the president and vice president and, as, and former president and new vice president get in terms of, look, I've never seen a circumstance where you ride through certain rural areas of the country People have signs there, stand, big Trump signs with a middle sign saying F Biden and the little kid standing there putting up his middle finger. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that is just inflammatory and a kind of viciousness. It's a very different thing than to say, look, I really disagree with Trump's the way he takes care of taxes, the way he has wants a $5 trillion tax cut for people who make him a lot of money next time around doesn't focus on working class people. And I asked him about his struggle in the debate and the calls from some Democrats for him to step aside. Do you feel like you've weathered the storm on, on this issue of whether you should be on the ticket or not? Look, 14 million people voted for me to be the nominee in the Democratic Party, okay? I listen to them. In your last TV interview, you were asked if you had watched the debate. Your answer was, I don't think so, no. Have you since seen it? I've seen pieces of it. I've not watched the whole debate. The president also responding to news of Donald Trump's new vice presidential pick. I want to ask you about, uh, just shortly before you and I sat down, former President Trump named his vice presidential pick, J.D. Vance. What does that tell you, uh, his qualities? What does that tell you about uh, former President Trump's values in terms of who he will surround himself with in a next administration, should he win? Well, it's not unusual. He's going to surround himself with people who agree with, completely with him, have a voting record. I support him, even though if you go back and listen to the things that J.D. Vance said about Trump. <laughs> and the president had a lot more. All right, let's discuss with our political experts who are listening very closely to what the president United States just said, David Chow, you nearly had. Well, the first thing, Wolf, is on the question of the status of his candidacy, Lester Holt asked him, do you believe you've weathered this storm inside your own party? I didn't hear an answer. All I heard was 14 million people voted for me to be the nominee. I listened to them. That, that does not answer the question of whether or not he thinks he's weathered this moment. 
of Democrats in his own party asking for him to step down as the nominee. And I thought that was telling. I also thought, just in the comparison to the interview with George Stephanopoulos, again, and we saw this a little bit at the NATO press conference, I, he clearly seems to have gotten some advice that he needs to not be as defiant in this moment, but have a little bit more humility. And I think he was still trying to strike that tone, though clearly indicating he plans to honor the primary process and he's the nominee and is, I'm sure his plan hasn't changed to remain the candidate. Audie, how did you see it? Well, there was a sense that the seriousness of the uh, attempted assassination had quieted any other political chatter on any other topic. But the truth is, by the end of this week, there will be the almost obligatory post-convention bounce. And I'm sure Democrats will freak out all over again, and that dialogue will return. Yeah, but the longer that they wait, the longer that this goes on without Joe Biden making a move off the ticket, the more this benefits him. We're going to move closer to the likelihood that the Democrat, Democratic committee would do some sort of virtual roll call vote to solidify his nomination. That essentially seals the deal. And the longer we wait, the more space Joe Biden has from the campaign, the better it is for him to weather that storm. And I agree with David, while he didn't quite answer the question, he's also sort of ignoring yeah. all everybody in his party mm -hmm. who's trying to push him out yeah. right now, saying it's up to the voters, I got 14 million votes. Well, he didn't really have a serious primary. Right, yeah, yeah. But, but I think it was a pretty definitive uh, answer here. And he's given, you know, a similar answer, which is he's not leaving the race. He, he gave a pretty uh, defiant speech, I think, in Michigan uh, last week. Listen, he's going to try to be out there as much as possible this week. This is one of the interviews he's doing. He's going out to Vegas talking to black uh, and brown voters there. He's going to be on BT. He's going to be on Winnie Young as well. You know, he, he has a base. And some of those people, particularly African-American voters, they are riding with Biden. And I think that was to his answer, too, when he said, I've got those 14 million of votes from the primary process. Those are the people I'm going to listen to, not the Washington elites uh, who've been trying to push me out. I did think uh, one of his answers was when Lester Holt asked the attempted assassination to change the trajectory of the race. He said, I don't know. Uh, and we don't know. In the moment, uh, it certainly seems to have uh, galvanized and engendered support and certainly empathy for former President Donald Trump. Let's see how this convention goes. But to Manu's point, time is on President Biden's side here. That is what gives so many Democrats uh, so much pause and fear and worry because they believe or wonder if the window is sort of moved right before the shooting. That afternoon, we still haven't talked about this enough, Senator Chuck Schumer went down to Rehoboth for a meeting at President Biden's home. I'm told it was very candid and very frank, as frank as the Hakeem Jeffries, the House Democratic leader meeting two days earlier. And there were some who believed Biden should reconsider who thought he was maybe getting more to that point. And of course, the shooting uh, happened uh, literally in the next hour. So we don't know at this moment, but it has not eased the concern of many Democrats who think well of President Biden, but they worry what will happen to the Democratic ticket in those House and Senate races. I, Mano has uh, the talk up on Capitol Hill about potentially President Biden dropping out of this race. Has that gone away, at least for now? Well, privately, it still exists. Publicly, it has not. It's really subsided in the aftermath of the Trump shooting. Democrats really not wanting to engage in that discussion. But you guys are right. There's going to be a bounce out of this convention that will cause that discussion all over again. But what's really remarkable in all of this is just so how much Trump has just solidified the Republican post hold on the Republican Party. When Mike Lawler was here talking to you, Wolf, he is from a swing district in New York, typically the kind of person who would run away from the top of the ticket. He was here, he was fine defending his support for Donald Trump. That is much different with Joe Biden in his party right now, with so many members, including in those swing districts and swing seats, running away from the top of the ticket because they're concerned about how you can drag them down.